The second part of chapter nineteen of Women in Love. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter nineteen. Mooney. The second part. The next day, however, he felt wistful and yearning. He thought he had been wrong, perhaps. Perhaps he had been wrong to go to her with an idea of what he wanted. Was it really only an idea? Or was it the interpretation of a profound yearning? If the latter, how was it he was always talking about sensual fulfilment? The two did not agree very well. Suddenly he found himself face to face with a situation. It was as simple as this, fatally simple. On the one hand, he knew he did not want a further sensual experience, something deeper, darker than ordinary life could give. He remembered the African fetishes he had seen at Halliday's so often. There came back to him one, a statuette about two feet high, a tall, slim, elegant figure from West Africa, in dark wood, glossy and suave. It was a woman, with hair dressed high like a melon-shaped dome. He remembered her vividly. She was one of his soul's intimates. Her body was long and elegant. Her face was crushed tiny like a beetle's. She had rows of round, heavy collars like a column of quoits on her neck. He remembered her, her astonishing, cultured elegance, her diminished, beetle face, the astounding long, elegant body on short, ugly legs, with such protuberant buttocks, so weighty and unexpected, below her slim, long loins. She knew what he himself did not know. She had thousands of years of purely sensual, purely unspiritual knowledge behind her. It must have been thousands of years since her race had died, mystically. That is, since the relation between the senses and the outspoken mind had broken, leaving the experience all in one sort, mystically sensual. Thousands of years ago, that which was imminent in himself must have taken place in these Africans. The goodness, the holiness, the desire for creation and productive happiness must have lapsed, leaving the single impulse for knowledge in one sort. Mindless, progressive knowledge through the senses, knowledge arrested and ending in the senses, mystic knowledge in disintegration and dissolution, knowledge such as the beetles have, which live purely within the world of corruption and cold dissolution. This was why her face looked like a beetle's, this was why the Egyptians worshipped the ball-rolling scarab, because of the principle of knowledge in dissolution and corruption. There is a long way we can travel after the death-break, after that point when the soul in intense suffering breaks, breaks away from its organic hold like a leaf that falls. We fall from the connection with life and hope. We lapse from pure integral being, from creation and liberty, and we fall into the long, long African process of purely sensual understanding, knowledge in the mystery of dissolution. He realised now that this is a long process, thousands of years it takes after the death of the creative spirit. He realised that there were great mysteries to be unsealed, sensual, mindless, dreadful mysteries, far beyond the phallic cult. How far, in their inverted culture, 
had these West Africans gone beyond phallic knowledge. Very, very far. Birkin recalled again the female figure, the elongated, long, long body, the curious, unexpected, heavy buttocks, the long, imprisoned neck, the face with tiny features like a beetle's. This was far beyond any phallic knowledge, sensual, subtle realities, far beyond the scope of phallic investigation. There remained this way, this awful African process, to be fulfilled. It would be done differently by the white races. The white races, having the Arctic North behind them, the vast abstraction of ice and snow, would fulfil a mystery of ice-destructive knowledge, snow-abstract annihilation. Whereas the West Africans, controlled by the burning death abstraction of the Sahara, had been fulfilled in sun-destruction, the putrescent mystery of sun-rays. Was this then all that remained? Was there left now nothing but to break off from the happy creative being? Was the time up? Is our day of creative life finished? Does there remain to us only the strange, awful afterwards of the knowledge in dissolution, the African knowledge, but different in us, who are blonde and blue-eyed from the north? Birkin thought of Gerald. He was one of these strange, white, wonderful demons from the north, fulfilled in the destructive frost mystery. And was he fated to pass away in this knowledge, this one process of frost knowledge, death by perfect cold? Was he a messenger, an omen of the universal dissolution into whiteness and snow? Birkin was frightened. He was tired, too, when he had reached this length of speculation. Suddenly his strange... Strained attention gave way. He could not attend to these mysteries any more. There was another way, the way of freedom. There was the paradisal entry into pure, single being, the individual soul taking precedence over love and desire for union, stronger than any pangs of emotion. A lovely state of free, proud singleness, which accepted the obligation of the permanent connection with others, and with the other submits to the yoke and leash of love, but never forfeits its own proud individual singleness, even while it loves and yields. There was the other way, the remaining way, and he must run to follow it. He thought of Ursula. How sensitive and delicate she really was, her skin so over-fine, as if one's skin were wanting. She was really so marvellously gentle and sensitive. Why did he ever forget it? He must go to her at once. He must ask her to marry him. They must marry at once, and so make a definite pledge, enter into a definite communion. He must set out at once and ask her this moment. There was no moment to spare. He drifted on swiftly to Beldover, half unconscious of his own movement. He saw the town on the slope of the hill, not straggling, but as if walled in with the straight final streets of miners' dwellings, making a great square, and it looked like Jerusalem to his fancy. The world was all strange and transcendent. Rosalind opened the door to him. She started slightly as a young girl will, and said, "'Oh, I'll tell father,' with which she disappeared, leaving Birkin in the hall, looking at some reproductions from Picasso, lately introduced by Gudrun. He was admiring the almost wizard, sensuous apprehension of the earth when Will Brangwen appeared rolling down his shirt-sleeves. "'Well,' said Brangwen, "'I'll get a coat.' 
and he too disappeared for a moment. Then he returned and opened the door of the drawing-room, saying, "'You must excuse me. I was just doing a bit of work in the shed. Come inside, will you?' Birkin entered and sat down. He looked at the bright, reddish face of the other man, at the narrow brow and the very bright eyes, and at the rather sensual lips that unrolled wide and expansive under the black cropped moustache. How curious it was that this was a human being! What Brangwen thought himself to be, how meaningless it was, confronted with the reality of him! Birkin could see only a strange, inexplicable, almost patternless collection of passions and desires and suppressions and traditions and mechanical ideas, all cast unfused and disunited into this slender, bright-faced man of nearly fifty, who was as unresolved now as he was at twenty, and as uncreated. How could he be the parent of Ursula, when he was not created himself? He was not a parent. A slip of living flesh had been transmitted through him, but the spirit had not come from him. The spirit had not come from any ancestor. It had come out of the unknown. A child is the child of the mystery, or it is uncreated. "'The weather's not so bad as it has been,' said Brangwen, after waiting a moment. There was no connection between the two men. "'No,' said Birkin. "'It was full moon two days ago.' "'Oh, you believe in the moon, then, affecting the weather?' "'No, I don't think I do. I don't really know enough about it.' "'You know what they say. The moon and the weather may change together, but the change of the moon won't change the weather.' "'Is that it?' said Birkin. "'I hadn't heard it.' There was a pause. Then Birkin said, "'Am I hindering you? I called to see Ursula, really. Is she at home?' "'I don't believe she is. I believe she's gone to the library. "'I'll just see.' Birkin could hear him inquiring in the dining-room. "'No,' he said, coming back. "'But she won't be long. You wanted to speak to her?' Birkin looked across at the other man, with curious, calm, clear eyes. "'As a matter of fact,' he said, "'I wanted to ask her to marry me.' A point of light came on the golden-brown eyes of the elder man. "'Oh!' he said, looking at Birkin, then dropping his eyes before the calm, steadily watching look of the other. "'Was she expecting you, then?' "'No,' said Birkin. "'No? I didn't know anything of this sort was on foot,' Brangwen smiled awkwardly. Birkin looked back at him and said to himself, I wonder why it should be on foot. Aloud, he said, No, it's perhaps rather sudden. At which, thinking of his relationship with Ursula, he added, But I don't know. Quite sudden, is it? Ah, oh, said Brangwen, rather baffled and annoyed. In one way, replied Birkin, not in another. There was a moment's pause, after which Brangwen said, "'Well, she pleases herself.' "'Oh, yes,' said Birkin calmly. A vibration came into Brangwen's strong voice, as he replied, "'Though I shouldn't want her to be in too big a hurry, either. It's no good looking round afterwards when it's too late.' "'Oh, it need never be too late,' said Birkin, "'as far as that goes.' "'How do you mean?' asked the father. "'If one repents being married, the marriage is at an end,' said Birkin. "'You think so?' "'Yes.' "'Aye, well, that may be your way of looking at it.' Birkin, in silence, thought to himself, "'So it may. As for your way of looking at it, William Brangwen, it needs a little explaining.' "'I suppose—' said Brangwen. "'You know what sort of people we are. 
what sort of a bringing up she's had. She, thought Birkin to himself, remembering his childhood's corrections, is the cat's mother. Do I know what sort of a bringing up she's had? he said aloud. He seemed to annoy Brangwen intentionally. "'Well,' he said, "'she's had everything that's right for a girl to have, as far as possible, as far as we could give it her.' "'I'm sure she has,' said Birkin, which caused a perilous full stop. The father was becoming exasperated. There was something naturally irritant to him in Birkin's mere presence. "'And I don't want to see her going back on it all,' he said, in a clanging voice. "'Why?' said Birkin. This monosyllable exploded in Brangwen's brain like a shot. "'Why? I don't believe in your new-fangled ways and new-fangled ideas, in and out like a frog in a gallipot. It would never do for me.' Birkin watched him with steady, emotionless eyes. The radical antagonism in the two men was rousing. "'Yes, but are my ways and ideas newfangled?' asked Birkin. "'Are they?' Brangwen caught himself up. "'I'm not speaking of you in particular,' he said. "'What I mean is that my children have been brought up to think and do according to the religion that I was brought up in myself, and I don't want to see them going away from that.' There was a dangerous pause. "'And beyond that?' asked Birkin. The father hesitated. He was in a nasty position. "'Eh? What do you mean? All I want to say is that my daughter—' He tailed off into silence, overcome by futility. He knew that in some way he was off the track. "'Of course,' said Birkin. I don't want to hurt anybody or influence anybody. Ursula does exactly as she pleases." There was a complete silence, because of the utter failure in mutual understanding. Birkin felt bored. Her father was not a coherent human being. He was a roomful of old echoes. The eyes of the younger man rested on the face of the elder. Brangwen looked up and saw Birkin looking at him. His face was covered with inarticulate anger and humiliation, and sense of inferiority in strength. "'And as for beliefs, that's one thing,' he said. "'But I'd rather see my daughters dead to-morrow than that they should be at the beck and call of the first man that likes to come and whistle for them.' A queer, painful light came into Birkin's eyes. "'As to that,' he said, "'I only know that it's much more likely that it's I who am at the beck and call of the woman than she at mine.' Again there was a pause. The father was somewhat bewildered. "'I know,' he said. "'She'll please herself. She always has done. I've done my best for them, but that doesn't matter. They've got themselves to please. And if they can help it, they'll please nobody but themselves.' But she's a right to consider her mother, and me as well." Brangwen was thinking his own thoughts. "'And I tell you this much, I would rather bury them than seeing them getting into a lot of loose ways, such as you see everywhere nowadays. I'd rather bury them.' "'Yes, but you see,' said Birkin, slowly, rather wearily, bored again by this new turn. They won't give either you or me the chance to bury them, because they're not to be buried." Brangwen looked at him, in a sudden flare of impotent anger. "'Now, Mr. Birkin,' he said, "'I don't know what you've come here for, and I don't know what you're asking for. But my daughters are my daughters, and it's my business to look after them while I can.' Birkin's brows knitted suddenly, his eyes concentrated in mockery but he remained perfectly stiff and still. There was a pause. "'I've nothing against your marrying Ursula,' Brangwen began at length. "'It's got nothing to do with me. She'll do as she likes, me or no me.' Birkin turned away, 
looking out of the window and letting go his consciousness. After all, what good was this? It was hopeless to keep it up. He would sit on till Ursula came home, then speak to her, then go away. He would not accept trouble at the hands of her father. It was all unnecessary, and he himself need not have provoked it. The two men sat in complete silence, Birkin almost unconscious of his own whereabouts. He had come to ask her to marry him. Well, then, he would wait on and ask her. As for what she said, whether she accepted or not, he did not think about it. He would say what he had come to say, and that was all he was conscious of. He accepted the complete insignificance of this household for him. But everything now was as if fated. He could see one thing ahead, and no more. From the rest he was absolved entirely from the time being. It had to be left to fate and chance to resolve the issues. At length they heard the gate. They saw her coming up the steps with a bundle of books under her arm. Her face was bright and abstracted as usual, with the abstraction that look of being not quite there, not quite present to the facts of reality that galled her father so much. She had a maddening faculty of assuming a light of her own which excluded the reality, and within which she looked radiant as if in sunshine. They heard her go into the dining-room and drop her armful of books on the table. "'Did you bring me that girl's own?' cried Rosalind. "'Yes, I brought it, but I forgot which one it was you wanted.' "'You would!' cried Rosalind angrily. "'It's right, for a wonder.' Then they heard her say something in a lowered tone. "'Where?' cried Ursula. Again her sister's voice was muffled. Brangwen opened the door and called in his strong, brazen voice, "'Ursula!' She appeared in a moment, wearing her hat. "'Oh, how do you do?' she cried, seeing Birkin, and all dazzled as if taken by surprise. He wondered at her, knowing she was aware of his presence. She had her queer, radiant, breathless manner, as if confused by the actual world, unreal to it, having a complete, bright world of herself alone. "'Have I interrupted a conversation?' she asked. "'No, only a complete silence,' said Birkin. "'Oh,' said Ursula, vaguely, absent. Their presence was not vital to her. She was withheld. She did not take them in. It was a subtle insult that never failed to exasperate her father. "'Mr. Birkin came to speak to you, not to me,' said her father. "'Oh, did he?' she exclaimed vaguely, as if it did not concern her. Then, recollecting herself, she turned to him rather radiantly, but still quite superficially, and said, "'Was it anything special?' "'I hope so,' he said, ironically. "'To propose to you, according to all accounts,' said her father. "'Oh,' said Ursula. "'Oh!' mocked her father, imitating her. "'Have you nothing more to say?' She winced, as if violated. "'Did you really come to propose to me?' she asked of Birkin, as if it were a joke. "'Yes,' he said. "'I suppose I came to propose.' He seemed to fight shy of the last word. "'Did you?' she cried, with her vague radiance. He might have been saying anything whatsoever. She seemed pleased. Yes, he answered. I wanted to—I wanted you to agree to marry me. She looked at him. His eyes were flickering with mixed lights, wanting something of her, yet not wanting it. She shrank a little, as if she were exposed to his eyes, and as if it were a pain to her. She darkened. Her soul clouded over. She turned aside. 
she had been driven out of her own radiant single world. And she dreaded contact. It was almost unnatural to her at these times. Yes, she said vaguely, in a doubting, absent voice. Birkin's heart contracted swiftly, in a sudden fire of bitterness. It all meant nothing to her. He had been mistaken again. She was in some self-satisfied world of her own. He and his hopes were accidentals, violations to her. It drove her father to a pitch of mad exasperation. He had had to put up with this all his life from her. "'Well, what do you say?' he cried. She winced. Then she glanced down at her father, half frightened, and she said, "'I didn't speak, did I?' as if she were afraid she might have committed herself. "'No,' said her father, exasperated. "'But you needn't look like an idiot. You've got your wits, haven't you?' She ebbed away in silent hostility. "'I've got my wits. What does that mean?' she repeated in a sullen voice of antagonism. "'You heard what was asked you, didn't you?' cried her father in anger. "'Of course I heard.' "'Well, then, can't you answer?' thundered her father. "'Why should I?' At the impertinence of this retort he went stiff, but he said nothing. "'No,' said Birkin, to help out the occasion, "'there's no need to answer at once. You can say when you like.' Her eyes flashed with a powerful light. "'Why should I say anything?' she cried. "'You do this off your own bat. It has nothing to do with me. Why do you both want to bully me?' "'Bully you! Bully you!' cried her father in bitter, rancorous anger. "'Bully you! Why, it's a pity you can't be bullied into some sense and decency. Bully you! You'll see to that, you self-willed creature!' She stood suspended in the middle of the room, her face glimmering and dangerous. She was set in satisfied defiance. Birkin looked up at her. He too was angry. "'But none is bullying you,' he said, in a very soft, dangerous voice also. "'Oh, yes!' she cried. "'You both want to force me into something!' "'That is an illusion of yours.' he said ironically. "'Illusion!' cried her father. "'A self-opinionated fool, that's what she is!' Birkin rose, saying, "'However, we'll leave it for the time being.' And without another word he walked out of the house. "'You fool! You fool!' her father cried to her with extreme bitterness. She left the room and went upstairs, singing to herself, but she was terribly fluttered, as after some dreadful fight. From her window she could see Birkin going up the road. He went in such a blithe drift of rage that her mind wandered over him. He was ridiculous, but she was afraid of him. She was as if escaped from some danger. Her father sat below, powerless in humiliation and chagrin. It was as if he were possessed with all the devils after one of these unaccountable conflicts with Ursula. He hated her as if his only reality were in hating her to the last degree. He had all hell in his heart. But he went away to escape himself. He knew he must despair, yield, give in to despair, and have done. Ursula's face closed. She completed herself against them all. Recoiling upon herself, she became hard and self-completed, like a jewel. She was bright and invulnerable, quite free and happy, perfectly liberated in her self-possession. Her father had to learn not to see her blithe obliviousness, or it would have sent him mad. She was so radiant with all things in her possession of perfect hostility. She would go on now for days like this, in this bright, frank state of seemingly pure spontaneity, 
so essentially oblivious of the existence of anything but herself, but so ready and facile in her interest. Ah, it was a bitter thing for a man to be near her, and her father cursed his fatherhood. But he must learn not to see her, not to know. She was perfectly stable in resistance when she was in this state, so bright and radiant and attractive in her pure opposition, so very pure, and yet mistrusted by everybody, disliked on every hand. It was her voice, curiously clear and repellent, that gave her away. Only Gudrun was in accord with her. It was at these times that the intimacy between the two sisters was most complete, as if their intelligence were one. They felt a strong, bright bond of understanding between them, surpassing everything else. And during all these days of blind, bright abstraction and intimacy of his two daughters, the father seemed to breathe an air of death, as if he were destroyed in his very being. He was irritable to madness, he could not rest. His daughters seemed to be destroying him. But he was inarticulate and helpless against them. He was forced to breathe the air of his own death. He cursed them in his soul, and only wanted that they should be removed from him. They continued radiant in their easy female transcendency, beautiful to look at. They exchanged confidences. They were intimate in their revelations to the last degree, giving each other at last every secret. They withheld nothing. They told everything, till they were over the border of evil. And they armed each other with knowledge, they extracted the subtlest flavours from the apple of knowledge. It was curious how their knowledge was complementary, that of each to that of the other. Ursula saw her men as sons, pitied their yearning, and admired their courage, and wondered over them as a mother wonders over her child, with a certain delight in their novelty. But to Gudrun they were the opposite camp. She feared them and despised them, and respected their activities even ever much. "'Of course,' she said easily, "'there is a quality of life in Birkin which is quite remarkable.' There is an extraordinary rich spring of life in him, really amazing, the way he can give himself to things. But there are so many things in life that he simply doesn't know. Either he is not aware of their existence at all, or he dismisses them as merely negligible, things which are vital to the other person. In a way, he is not clever enough, he is too intense in spots. "'Yes!' cried Ursula. "'Too much of a preacher. "'He is really a priest.' "'Exactly. "'He can't hear what anybody else has to say. "'He simply cannot hear. "'His own voice is so loud. "'Yes! "'He cries you down.' "'He cries you down,' repeated Gudrun, "'and by mere force of violence. "'And, of course, it is hopeless. "'Nobody is convinced by violence. "'It makes talking to him impossible.' and living with him, I should think, would be more than impossible. "'You don't think one could live with him?' asked Ursula. "'I think it would be too wearing, too exhausting. One would be shouted down every time, and rushed into his way without any choice. He would want to control you entirely. He cannot allow that there is any other mind than his own. And then, the real clumsiness of his mind is its lack of self-criticism. No, I think it would be perfectly intolerable. Yes, assented Ursula vaguely. She only half agreed with Gudrun. The nuisance is, she said, that one would find almost any man intolerable after a fortnight. It's perfectly dreadful, said Gudrun. But Birkin, he is too positive. 
He couldn't bear it if you called your soul your own. Of him that is strictly true. Yes, said Ursula. You must have his soul. Exactly. And what can you conceive more deadly? This was all so true that Ursula felt jarred to the bottom of her soul with ugly distaste. She went on with the discord jarring and jolting through her in the most barren of misery. Then there started a revulsion from Gudrun. She finished life off so thoroughly. She made things so ugly and so final. As a matter of fact, even if it were as Gudrun said about Birkin, other things were true as well. But Gudrun would draw two lines under him and cross him out, like an account that is settled. There he was, summed up, paid for, settled, done with. And it was such a lie. This finality of Gudrun's, this dispatching of people and things in a sentence, it was all such a lie. Ursula began to revolt from her sister. One day, as they were walking along the lane, they saw a robin sitting on the top twig of a bush, singing shrilly. The sisters stood to look at him. An ironical smile flickered on Gudrun's face. "'Doesn't he feel important?' smiled Gudrun. "'Doesn't he?' exclaimed Ursula, with a little ironical grimace. "'Isn't he a little Lloyd George of the air?' "'Isn't he? Little Lloyd George of the air! That's just what they are!' cried Gudrun in delight. Then for days Ursula saw the persistent obtrusive birds as stout, short politicians lifting up their voices from the platform, little men who must make themselves heard at any cost. But even from this there came the revulsion. Some yellow hammers suddenly shot along the road in front of her. And they looked to her so uncanny and inhuman, like flaring yellow barbs shooting through the air on some weird living errand, that she said to herself, After all, it is impudence to call them little Lloyd Georges. They are really unknown to us. They are the unknown forces. It is impudence to look at them as if they were the same as human beings. They are of another world. How stupid anthropomorphism is! Gudrun is really impudent, insolent, making herself the measure of everything, making everything come down to human standards. Rupert is quite right. Human beings are boring, painting the universe with their own image. The universe is non-human, thank God! It seemed to her irreverence, destructive of all true life, to make little Lloyd Georges of the birds. It was such a lie towards the robins, and such a defamation. Yet she had done it herself. But under Gudrun's influence, so she exonerated herself. So she withdrew again from Gudrun, and from that which she stood for. She turned in spirit towards Birkin again. She had not seen him since the fiasco of his proposal. She did not want to, because she did not want the question of her acceptance thrust upon her. She knew what Birkin meant when he asked her to marry him. Vaguely, Without putting it into speech, she knew. She knew what kind of love, what kind of surrender he wanted. And she was not at all sure that this was the kind of love that she herself wanted. She was not at all sure that it was this mutual unison in separateness that she wanted. She wanted unspeakable intimacies. She wanted to have him utterly, finally, to have him as her own. Oh, 
so unspeakably, in intimacy, to drink him down, ah, oh, like a life-draught. She made great professions to herself of her willingness to warm his foot-soles between her breasts after the fashion of the nauseous Meredith poem. But only on condition that he, her lover, loved her absolutely, with complete self-abandon. And subtly enough, she knew he would never abandon himself finally to her. He did not believe in final self-abandonment. He said it openly. It was his challenge. She was prepared to fight him for it, for she believed in an absolute surrender to love. She believed that love far surpassed the individual. He said the individual was more than love, or than any relationship. For him, the bright, single soul accepted love as one of its conditions, a condition of its own equilibrium. She believed that love was everything. Man must render himself up to her. He must be quaffed to the dregs by her. Let him be her man utterly, and she in return would be his humble slave, whether she wanted it or not. End of chapter 19 Recording by Ruth Golding